Australia is known for being the home of kangaroos, koalas, beach barbecues and Mick Taylor. Actor John Jarrett portrays the sinister lead antagonist of the Wolf Creek films and TV series. Mick is described as a sadistic, psychopathic, xenophobic serial killer who preys on both tourists and native Australians alike within the Australian outback. He views tourists as foreign vermin, a different species pretty much, but doesn't discriminate when it comes to the nationality of his victims, taking out anyone that gets in his way. The character is a perfect example of an opportunistic predator, a man who embodies evil and uses his victims to satisfy his sadistic desires. Mick Taylor is probably the most well-known and memorable Australian antagonist within the film and TV genre. And despite the cruelty that he exhibits on screen, his entertaining personality, quotable dialogue and dark sense of humour won me and many other people over. The Wolf Creek series is truly a cult classic and Mick Taylor steals the show. He is truly an Australian nightmare and he's the main reason as to why I'll never visit Australia. Thankfully Mick Taylor is fictional. He couldn't exist in real life. Or could he? As much as I'd love to say that the possibility of a Mick Taylor roaming Australia committing random murders is impossible, the reality is very different. Ivan Miller, a real life serial killer, who has a confirmed victim count of seven, mostly foreign backpackers it would turn out, was an inspiration for the Wolf Creek screenplay. There was another Australian crime case which inspired Wolf Creek also, but Malat's case is the topic of today's video and stands out for being a main source of this inspiration. Today I bring to you all the case of the backpacker murderer. Hope you enjoy. The Australian state of New South Wales is home to Belanglo State Forest, a popular place for recreational activity. It sits 5 kilometres from the Hume Highway, a roadway in which one man had been patrolling in search for prey for years. A man whose secret graveyard in Belanglo State Forest was about to be disturbed. Two local people were doing a routine run in the forest when they smelt a foul odour in September 1992. They were off the beaten path doing orienteering and decided to investigate the smell, assuming that it was coming from a decomposing animal. What they found instead remained with them forever. Walking upon the smell's origins, they spotted clumps of human hair and someone's clothing. Approaching even more cautiously now, they realised that below a pile of forest debris, a young woman's body was laying face down, arms crossed behind her back. Immediately, they halted their run and called police. A major search of the immediate area was conducted given the grisly discovery. Everyone knew that this wasn't any type of accident given the state of the body. The victim had been stabbed many times and shot just as many times. The whole scene just spoke volumes to the sadistic person who was responsible. On combing the crime scene, investigators would realise that there were actually two bodies, one of which was 30 metres from the other. One of the victims had been essentially used as human target practice, her body riddled with 22 rifle rounds. The second victim had been killed with a hunting knife, deliberately paralysed while still alive, by the offender's intended cutting of her spinal cord. The crime scenes were savage, and police put out an appeal for information whilst continuing to search the forest. They were stunned by the brutality of the murders, and everything that had been done to the still nameless two female victims led to speculation on the motive, and whether there were more victims hidden in the brush. It wouldn't take long before faces were paired to the two women because of missing persons reports filed earlier the same year and dental record confirmation. UK backpackers Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters were both in their early 20s. Caroline had tried to join the police force back home, but was told that she needed more life experience. The trip to Australia was certainly proven to be one that would help her to gain said experience. She'd done some work in Australia and had met all kinds of kind-hearted people, one of these being Joanne. Joanne always wanted to visit Australia ever since she was a young girl. Australia was an exotic land to her and now her wish had come true. Having worked as a nanny back home, she was known for being a caring and independent young woman. Both Caroline and Joanne had promising futures, futures that would be unexpectedly cut short in the blink of an eye. They were both last seen asking for directions to the Hume Highway as they hitchhiked in April 1992. Investigators had two confirmed victims, both foreign nationals, and realised the future of the case could involve more people who didn't live locally. 
a clear offender profile was beginning to be put together and investigators began to consider a theory based on the murder methods. It could be something far rarer and unique when it came to a serial killer investigation. Because of the two different murder styles, knives and guns being used, could there be two offenders? Investigators were left to speculate on that answer as they looked over new information flooding into the tip line. In the following months, more of the state forest was scoured and tragically, more human remains turned up. These were the remains of James Gibson and Deborah Everest, both Australian teens aged only 19. James was into the arts and had taken Deborah, currently studying psychology, on a trip to a festival before they were set to resume their studies. To make it to the festival, they would have to hitchhike along the Hume Highway. Once again, they were never heard from again. Simone Schmiedel, known as Simmy, was a German 21-year-old who was backpacking alone when she went missing along the Hume Highway. Simmy loved to travel, and she'd backpacked before along the same route, but this time she was alone. She was never heard from again. German lovers Gabor Norgebauer and Anja Habschied were 21 and 20 years old. Like with James and Deborah, they'd each been studying but were travelling around for a time before returning to their courses. The couple had previously backpacked around Europe and more recently Indonesia. Unexpectedly, they ended up in Australia last minute and went missing without a trace. Investigators now had a confirmed victim count of seven. National and international media descended to New South Wales and police needed answers. However, despite numerous credible tips and a hefty reward money sum, the investigation wouldn't pick up much steam for another two years. The year was now 1994 and a British man named Paul Onions was at home when he saw the troublesome report. A report about an active serial killer in Australia, funnily enough in an area in which he'd experienced something terrifying years earlier. Paul phoned into the tip line for the unsolved serial killer case because he had a sick feeling, a feeling that he may now be involved in the case. The location and the backpacker theme stood out to him. Upon making contact with New South Wales police, they eventually flew him back to Australia, a land in which he had come to realise wasn't all that safe anymore. On his arrival, Paul told police that he had been hitchhiking along the Hume Highway in 1990, years before the discovery of the bodies in Belanglo State Forest. He'd been picked up by a friendly Australian, a man who'd called himself Bill. Bill had a handlebar moustache and drove a silver four-door Nissan. According to Paul, Bill was chilled out at first, but Paul became suspicious during the drive, when the man pulled over to grab some cassette tapes from the boot. Paul glanced around the vehicle and saw some rope. A bit odd, he thought. It wasn't until the man reappeared with a brandish pistol that Paul jumped from the car. The man had yelled, this is a robbery, but Paul wasn't hanging around. He'd already told the man that he was financially struggling. It wasn't just a simple robbery. Paul knew that if he complied with the man, he'd die. Whilst he ran, he began zigzagging, the man shooting at Paul and even at the woman who Paul screamed at to stop to rescue him. The shooter gave up and sped away. Paul was shaken up big star by the whole attempted robbery. He knew that it was something far darker, but at that time, little could be done. But, Karma had returned and was about to put the offender in the firing line. With the help of Paul, a sketch of the suspect was drawn and police narrowed in on a local man named Ivan Milat. Milat had come up as a suspect already because of a 1971 sex offence, and he was no stranger to crime, and neither were some of his family members. Malat had grown up in Western Sydney with 14 siblings and some grew up to be law-abiding citizens whilst others, Ivan included, took the exact opposite path. Malat, like many other serial killers, came from a highly dysfunctional family. The major supporting evidence for this being the fact that he reportedly banged his own sister. Yet, this guy was seriously disturbed. One of Ivan's own brothers said that he was likely going to murder someone in the future and Ivan was only 10 when his brother made this assessment. Quite clearly, Ivan was someone who engaged in crime and seemingly just escalated his crimes over time. It looked as though with every year he got worse, from taking part in armed robberies to the paralysing of a taxi driver during a botched robbery attempt and to the sex offence that he was never convicted of in court. Pretty much all of the severe crimes that he committed, he didn't get busted for, he was a serious threat to the communities in which he resided, but over time, he managed to blend in and present a fairly normal facade to his co-workers and neighbours. 
Malat was now the main target of the police and they kicked in this door in 1994. They'd reason to believe that he was their serial killer. Police subsequently found all sorts of incriminating items, many belonging to the seven murdered victims, from their clothing to foreign currency and sleeping bags. It was over for Ivan and he was taken to jail. Ivan Malat was hit with seven life sentences and spent the rest of his life in maximum security prisons. Malat self-harmed over the remainder of his time locked away and whilst he wore an adult diaper, the cancer that he had ended up slowly eating away at his body and he died in 2019. In conclusion, many people feel as though Ivan killed many more people. Some add another 20 victims to his body count, but since Ivan never confessed publicly, that answer has gone with him to the grave. It is still widely believed that more than one of Ivan's brothers took part with him in some of the murders. Richard Millat is believed to be someone who was involved, although there's little concrete evidence that supports this claim. The story of Ivan Millat really expresses the danger that some people pose to society. Even though he's gone, families of his victims still have to face every new day without their loved ones being present. And even though films like Wolf Creek and characters like Mick Taylor both serve as entertainment and an escape from everyday life, we have to remember the stories that inspired the screenplays. Stories about the victims and their shattered dreams. Stories about human depravity and the lives that are destroyed because of it. This has been the story of Ivan Malat. As always, thank you for watching.